I find his lack of balance disturbing. It's all that data, bro. With SLT Mega Deals, he's got double data for the next two months. Making headlines on first at nine. Experts unimpressed. Sri Lanka Singapore FDA restricts Sri Lanka government's sovereignty, says it's of no use. GMOA urges legal action. A new marketing strategy. New Minister of Ports says a comprehensive strategy for ports is under formulation. Shocking news. Sri Lanka ranked most corrupt among cricket governing bodies. ICC offers amnesty to Sri Lanka cricketers. Bangladesh elections. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has secured her third consecutive term in disputed vote. Me utsav same smart android parkshanin in a singer vista tv ekak miladi ganna obata hitta pirenna vaase rasak onema singer pradarshana agareki. As today marks the end of a very eventful year for the entire country, it's also the end of an era for the island's corporate world as one of Sri Lanka's renowned professionals bade farewell after an illustrious career. Also tonight, we have some shocking news and revelations on acts from the past. Well, as everyone around the globe is bidding a very wary Monday farewell. We'd like to start there to an unsettling year filled with challenges. We say goodbye. But 2019 is to dawn in a few hours for us here in Sri Lanka. But several countries in the world have already celebrated the dawn of the new year with much anticipation. New Zealanders were amongst the first in the world to celebrate the arrival of 2019 with a fireworks display that erupted from Auckland's 328 meter tall sky tower. Thousands of revelers on the waterfront watched brightly colored fireworks and laser lighting shooting into the night sky over the city's harbor. Well, Australians then joined in for the celebrations ushering in the dawn of year 2019. Also tonight, we did say shocking news. The International Cricket Council has offered an amnesty period to Sri Lanka players to own up any involvement in corrupt activities, breach of conduct, or reveal information on player behavior tarnishing the spirit of the game. Minister of Sports Harin Fernando conveyed to media the outcome of a meeting with Alex Marshall of the International Cricket Council's anti-corruption unit pointed out that the local body was identified by the cricket governing authority as the most corrupt of all cricket controlling boards. A host of scandals have blocked and rocked Sri Lanka cricket in recent years, including a match-fixing controversy revealed in a sting operation carried out for a TV documentary while the ICC Anti-Corruption Unit has regularly investigated and um, undercard cases related to Sri Lanka cricketers. Harin Fernando, the newly appointed Minister of Sports, pointed out that an Ombudsman for Sports in Sri Lanka is urgently needed in order to address irregularities, corruption and lack of attention to uplift all sports in the country. What we are trying to do within the next week is that we will establish a post called the Sports Ombudsman and the Sports Ombudsman's uh, duty would be to mediate for their issues any sportsman is facing in the country and my vision is in 2019 there shouldn't be a single sportsman complaining that they don't have equipment or facilities to run. So on a daily basis, we will have a call center running with five people and we will have a proper website where they can complain, show us pictures of the issues they're facing. 
Sports Minister Harin Fernando last week met Alex Marshall, the general manager of the ICC's anti-corruption unit, an outcome of which is shocking. Unfortunately, Sri Lanka has been ranked as one of the worst countries in corruption. That is nothing to be proud of. In Sri Lanka, from top to bottom, everything is corrupted. And they are establishing an office here and we will be supporting it. Also, ICC requested that they are going to give an amnesty to all. It's how the game has come to distribute. They are worried about that and they are worried about the violence vulnerability of young players coming into sports and how they are being approached that is very bad for the game so we'll see what ICC tells us first then I will appoint one of the best committees because these people are very clean they have no background of any corruption in the past so I'm, I'm quite confident this will work and this has to happen for cricket and I pleaded these gentlemen to come forward and help clean cricket and they seem to be quite positive I have left it to them to decide how they want to run it how they want to get it I will only do the support Sri Lanka cricketers can now come forward during this period of amnesty with information of any corrupt activities or wrongdoing in the game. Minister Harin Fernando also reiterated ICC's plan to establish a permanent office in Sri Lanka to probe cricket-related corruption in the island nation. Sri Lanka cricket players entangled in a corruption scandal after a report by Indian detectives in year 2000 named a number of players connected to malpractice. In 2001, the International Cricket Council's Anti-Corruption Unit, headed by former Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Paul Condon and two members of the ICC Anti-Corruption Unit, visited Sri Lanka as part of its investigation into corruption in cricket. They met with cricket officials, ministers and players and focused specifically on allegations made against Sri Lankan players in the Indian CBI report. Issuing a statement recently on the outcome of its ongoing probe, the ICC said it is investigating serious allegations of corruption in Sri Lanka. In the meantime, Sri Lanka former cricket captain Sanat Jayasuriya was charged with two counts of breach in the ICC's anti-corruption code, while bowling coach Noan Soiza was suspended over charges of match-fixing. The first charge against Jayasuriya, however, included failure or refusal to cooperate with an investigation carried out by the ICC's anti-corruption unit. The ICC, on behalf of the Emirates Cricket Board, also charged former Sri Lanka cricketer Dilhara Lokuhetige with three counts of breach in the ECB's anti-corruption code relating to the T10 Cricket League played in the UAE last year. In such a backdrop, the ICC will establish its permanent office in Sri Lanka to probe corruption within the game in the island nation. And in a new year message to the public, President Maitripala Sirisena says that year 2019 will be named as the year to work without corruption in politics. Earlier in the day, the President paid homage to the sacred temple of the tooth in Kandy and the Jayasri Mahabodhi in Anuradhapura to invoke blessings for the new year. Arriving in Kandy this morning, President Maitripala Sirisena paid homage to the temple of the tooth relic. The head of state then called on the chief prelate of the Malvata chapter, Most Venerable Tibbatuave Sri Sumangala Thera. The president also arrived at the Asgiri Gedige Raja Mahavihara temple and met with the deputy chief prelate of the Asgiri chapter, Venerable Vindarube Upali Thera. The president also inspected the archaeological center at the Asgiri Gedige Raja Mahavihara temple, which is under construction. The president later paid homage to the Jayasri Mahabodhi in Anuradhapura today. Meanwhile, President Maitri Palasiri Sena extended his New Year greetings to the people. Labana na vasara didas dahana me vasara lakpasi janatavata ubit magit adharaniya matru bhoomiyata vadat vasana avantu subhavadi ut vasarakbavata patkaragani mata silu denage samuhi katte saha vagakhi matula itwe vakila subhapatana apita rajya palne di prabal abiyogi akviti be nau dushene te virutta vaginiana pulul jati vada satane di didas dahana me varshe Dushane te virudda vasarak pasheng kriyatma karna ulul vedasata hanulata oba sam kenu kema sahayoge maitama gaura in nila city no. And we'll take a short commercial break. We'll be back with comments and outcome of the expert committee report on the Sri Lanka Singapore free trade agreement. Do stay with us. You are watching.
Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. The Port of Colombo has handled its 7 millionth 20-foot equivalent container units today, surpassing its previous record of 6 million TUs last year. Speaking at a function to mark the achievement, newly appointed Ports Minister Sagala Ratnayaka announced today that the government is working towards creating a comprehensive marketing policy that is beneficial for Sri Lanka's shipping industry. A special ceremony was held to welcome the 7 million 20 foot equivalent container units brought by MVCPO Hamburg of the MSC line. According to the Sri Lanka Ports Authority, it took Sri Lanka a period of one year to leap from 6 to 7 million TEUs, a feat that has not been accomplished in SLPS history. The ceremony was held under the auspices of newly appointed Ports Minister Sagar Ratnaika. In 83, we had handled only a million units a year. But what's phenomenal is the growth in the last three years. We were at 4 million units in 2010. 2015, we went up to 5 million. 2017, we went up to 6 million. And 2018, within one year, we increased it by a million. It's a lot to say about the country environment and a lot to say about the comprehensive strategy that has been put in place. Let's all get together and build upon those. We as a government will continue to build on stabilizing Sri Lanka and strengthening democracy in Sri Lanka and strengthening the even playing field for all uh, everybody in competition. Then we have to work on our marketing policy. It has to be a comprehensive policy. It can't be a policy for SLPA or it can't be a policy for the other players. It has to be a policy for Sri Lanka's shipping industry. And that's what we will be working in the next few months and years. And in your stock market update, the Colombo's benchmark all share price index closed positive at the end of trading for 2018. Price gains were seen in counters such as John Keel's Holdings, Salon Tobacco, and Melstico, with turnover crossing just 288 million rupees. A similar behavior was witnessed in more liquid SP SL20 index. High net worth and institutional investor participation was seen in commercial bank, while mixed interest was observed in soft logic. Holdings and John Q's Holdings. Foreigners in the meantime remained active, closing as net buyers, mainly due to foreign purchasing in soft logic holdings. Today, total foreign purchases accounted for about 57.5% of the entire turnover. And during this year, the ASPI and the SNP has uh, lost 4.98% and 14.61% respectively. The Sri Lankan rupee in the meantime fell 19% during this year, marking it one of the worst performing currencies in Asia as heavy foreign outflows from government securities weighed on the local currency. The rupee hit an all-time low of 183 rupees against the dollar in early trade, surpassing its previous record of 182 rupees and 90 cents marked in the prior session. It has weakened about 5.4% since Sri Lanka's political crisis began on the 26th of October and lost 19% so far this year, as I said. We'll take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other major currencies during the day.
And before you bring you more local business news, we move into your overseas news and making top international news. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has secured her third consecutive term with a landslide victory in this year's general election. The uh, Bangladeshi Premier's Awami League Party has won 288 of the 300 parliamentary seats contested, surpassing its previous election wins. The main opposition alliance, however, uh, rejected the violence mod polls. Bangladesh Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's Awami League party won a massive 288 out of 350 seats, while the main opposition alliance dominated by the Bangladesh Nationalist Party secured only six. The opposition has condemned the vote as farcical, marred by violence, intimidation and vote-rigging claims. 17 people were killed across the country in clashes between members of rival parties yesterday, despite the deployment of around 600,000 security personnel to prevent violence. More than 40 opposition candidates pulled out of the election after polls opened, citing vote rigging and ballot stuffing. The opposition claimed thousands of its activists were arrested in the lead up to the polls. Sheikh Hasina went into the polls on the back of a decade of impressive GDP growth in the world's second largest exporter of garments after China. She has been applauded for hosting nearly one million Rohingya refugees who took a shelter in Bangladesh after fleeing a brutal military offensive in neighbouring Myanmar. Both critics have accused Hasina of authoritarianism and crippling the opposition. Her bitter political rival and leader of the BNP, Khalid Azia, is serving a 17-year jail term for corruption. Still in international news, marking their strengthened diplomatic relations, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin exchanged New Year greetings today. In his congratulatory message on behalf of the Chinese government and people, Xi Jinping said that both countries have smoothly completed their respective important domestic political agendas and opened a new year for China-Russia ties in 2018. Xi has also expressed his willingness to work with Putin to prompt bilateral relations and cooperation in various fields to make new progress and bring more benefits to the two countries and peoples. Meanwhile, Putin, in his congratulatory message, extended warm New Year greetings to Xi and wished the Chinese people happiness and good health. He noted that the Russia-China Comprehensive Strategic Partnership of Coordination reached an unprecedented level this year with sub substantial political dialogue and rapidly expanding two-way trade. The two countries strengthened their relations in many areas with China's relationship with the U.S. Um, was deteriorating due to the trade dispute this year. And Russia's FSB State Security Agency today said that it has arrested a U.S. citizen caught spying in Moscow. It named him as Paul Walani, saying he was arrested in Moscow on the 28th of December and charged with the espionage. The FSB, Russia's main counter-espionage service, however, gave no further details. It found guilty, if found guilty rather, he faces between 10 and 20 years in jail. There has been no confirmation on these reports from the United States. However, spying accusations have been a persistent feature of Russia's relations with the United States and the United Kingdom this year. In March, the UK and its Western allies expelled more than 100 Russian diplomats. In response to the poisoning of former Russian spy Sergei Skirpal and his daughter Yulia in Salisbury. UK government accused the Russian state of carrying out the nerve agent attack. Russia denied the accusation and retaliated by expelling dozens of Western diplomats. We take a short commercial break before you bring you no news. You are watching. Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Dharana 24-7.
As you said, we do have disappointing news too. An expert committee report pointed out that entering into FTAs is of no use for Sri Lanka in the current context of the extremely weak competitiveness of the island in the global economic setup. The committee of experts appointed to evaluate the free trade agreement between Sri Lanka and Singapore argues that priority should be accorded to domestic policy reforms based on a coherent national development framework and a widely accepted national foreign trade policy before Sri Lanka exporters or explores uh, any more free trade agreements. The highly critical final report on the Singapore-Sri Lanka FTA was released today by the Presidential Committee of Experts appointed to study the pact. Following widespread criticism, President Maitri Pala Sirisena on the 10th of August this year appointed a committee of experts to evaluate and provide recommendations on the Sri Lanka-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. An area of scrutiny for the experts was the process of negotiation and approval for the FTA. In its 299-page final report released today, the experts note that the entire process was under the Ministry of Development Strategies and International Trade and criticised the fact that officials had held five rounds of negotiations without approval of the Cabinet of Ministers until Cabinet approval was granted to appoint an official negotiating team on the 4th of July 2017. The report also highlights that although relevant authorities adhered to acceptable practices since the 4th of July last year, serious lapses and defects were still observed after the submission of the final draft for Cabinet approval on the 22nd of December in 2017. The Attorney General in his letter on the 15th of January this year had mentioned that there was no legal impediment to the signing of the FTA if concurrence was obtained from the National Procurement Commission for the chapter on government procurement, necessary approvals were obtained from appropriate authorities for the relevant chapters and no opinion was expressed on the policy considerations or technical, financial and economic implications of the proposed FTA. The report highlights that the minister had indeed acted without attending to the conditions laid down by the cabinet in its conditional approval granted to the minister. The lapses relate to non-compliance with matters highlighted by the Attorney General as clearly included in the cabinet approval as a necessary condition to be fulfilled before signing. The experts are also of the view that consultations conducted by the Ministry were rather limited without a systematic and comprehensive consultative process to take care of conflicting views of and alternatives suggested by stakeholders. Experts also note that there were valid concerns expressed on issues of conflict of interest on the part of several members of the negotiating team, including the former chief negotiator. The inclusion of an official of the Attorney General's department in the negotiating team also appears to the committee as problematic in regard to conflict of interests. Touching on the impact of the removal of para tariffs over a period of three years, as mentioned in the budget speech 2018, the report says none of the government officials whom they consulted could clarify the envisaged process of para tariff removal or its time frame. Reports said that a desirable policy option would be to focus on targeted liberalisation so as to avoid interference with the growing industries drawing from the successful experiences of Japan, South Korea and Brazil during 1965-80s before they became complete free traders. The committee recommends that a Presidential Trade and Tariff Commission be appointed for the purpose of reforming the tariff structure along with the elimination of para-tariffs. The report is critical from an export orientation point of view, saying that entering into FTAs in anticipation of market access is of little use as Sri Lanka's exports are still unable to compete in the foreign markets due to supply-side constraints and the uncompetitive status of domestic firms. A major criticism voiced against the FTA is that it will open the door for foreign nationals with substandard qualifications, mainly from third-party countries using the permanent resident provision in Singapore, to enter into Sri Lanka for employment in different sectors posing a threat to Sri Lankan professionals. The committee notes that Mode 3, namely Commercial Presence and Mode 4, namely Presence of Natural Persons for the three categories Legal Advisory, Architectural and Engineering Services are unbound under the agreement. Another concern is the possibility of formation of manpower companies and importing labour from third-party countries. Despite views of representatives of the Ministry and BOI that left 
that the FTA will help establish a conducive investment climate and a rise in FDI inflows to Sri Lanka, the committee believes that it is unlikely to boost FDI inflows given the country's low competitiveness and productivity. Noting that there will be influence over border-related policies as well as beyond the border policies, the experts note that this restricts Sri Lankan government's sovereignty and policy autonomy that could be exercised to achieve development goals. The report went on to say that foreign firms affiliated to multinational corporations, which have sophisticated technological and managerial capabilities, can wipe out weaker local firms. Headed by former Vice-Chancellor of the Colombo University, W.D. Lakshman, the five-member committee emphasised that current context of Sri Lanka's extremely weak competitive position in the global economic setup. That entering into FTAs is of no use in the current context of Sri Lanka's extremely weak competitive position in the global economic setup. They stress that it is only through domestic economic reforms that economic growth will accelerate and improvement in people's living standard can the country move forward. Meanwhile, the Government Medical Officers Association called on the government to take legal action against those who are responsible for implementing the much scrutinized and criticized Sri Lanka Singapore Free Trade Agreement. Vice President of the GMOA, Dr. Sarada Kannangara, expressed these views at a media briefing in Colombo following the release of the expert committee report on the FTA. For negotiation of the trade agreement, WTO recommend. First thing is the authority. So the authority either has to be given by the president or by the parliament. Committee expressed that. The first round of negotiations start in 2016, but to gain the authority, the cabinet paper has been put forward in 2017. So which clearly mentioned that first five rounds of negotiation took place without a proper mandate or authority. They are clearly state this is a major administrative lapse in the whole process. So and there's a misuse of public funds because they have acted without an authority. They are mentioning that there's no cabinet approval being granted. There's no stakeholder consultation being taken place. Internal regulations has not been set up. Actually, this is a scam. So we have been telling this violate the basic principles of democracy and the natural justice either. And this would have been a major calamity, even goes beyond the bond scam. We need to act beyond these reports and we request the authorities to take necessary action to the culprits, especially the minister and the secretary and the negotiation team which has been acted without an authority granted by them and misuse the public funds. Sri Lanka's largest conglomerate, John Keel's Holdings, today bid adieu to its long-serving chairman, Susantha Ratnayaka, who had an illustrious career with the group for 39 years. Ratnayaka led a company with a workforce of over 20,300 for over a decade and chaired all subsidiary companies of the group. Current Deputy Chairman, Krishan Balendra, is to take the uh, chairmanship from tomorrow. Here's a tribute to a game-changer in Sri Lanka's corporate world. A product of Trinity College, Susanta Ratnayaka, who entered the workforce at the tender age of 19, was with John Keel's group for 39 years and has served as one of its board members since 1992. He was a chairman of JKH since 2006. With the wealth of management experience under his belt, he went on to become chairman of several listed and unlisted companies within the John Keels Group and also headed other organizations like the Employers Federation of Ceylon, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and Sri Lanka Tea Board. As the chairman of JKH, Ratnayaka has undertaken many ventures, most recently the launch of Cinnamon Life becoming a game changer in the real estate industry. After announcing his retirement on its 2017-2018 annual report in May, Ratnayaka's long journey with the conglomerate came to an end today. Video uploaded on the group's social media page showed a warm farewell to an individual who dedicated over 30 years of leadership to elevate the company to its current position. According to the group's succession plan, Deputy Chairman Krishan Balendra is to take over as chairman tomorrow at the beginning of 2019. Krishan is the son of the first Sri Lankan chairman of John Keel's holdings, Ken Balendra. 
Krishan Balendra will now take over the reins to lead Sri Lanka's largest listed conglomerate in the Colombo Stock Exchange with a 221.44 billion rupee market capitalization. He was appointed as an executive director of JKH in November 2016 and was later appointed as deputy chairman of JKH on January 1, 2018. During the tenure of Susantarat Naika in the last financial year, the group posted a revenue of 121 billion rupees and was able to garner a profit of 27.63 billion rupees, witnessing a 14% growth year on year. The group, which started off as a produce and exchange broker in the 1870s, became the first Sri Lankan company to be listed overseas with a workforce of over 20,300 and today has made its presence felt in virtually every major sphere of the economy from managing hotels and resorts in Sri Lanka and the Maldives, consumer food and retails, property, transportation, financial services, IT and plantation. And we move on to sports. India's left-hand opener Smriti Mandana has won the Rachel Hayhoe Flint Award, becoming ICC Women's Cricketer of the Year and the ICC Women's ODI Player of the Year. The 22-year-old scored 669 runs at an average of 66.90 in 12 ODIs and 622 runs at a strike rate of 130.67 in 25 T20 international games. Mandana played a crucial role in India's semi-final appearance at the ICC Women's World T20 in the West Indies, scoring 178 runs in five matches at a strike rate of 125.35. As for her batting skills, she is currently ranked fourth in the ICC's Women's Player Rankings of ODI and tenth in the ICC Women's Player Rankings for T20 internationals. As we say goodbye to 2018, it's a revolutionizing year for us at other than a 24 7 starting tomorrow. We'll see you again tomorrow on First at 9. Until then, take care and good night.